I've been at ARM for over four years and actually started the uh, server investigation uh, just about four and a half years ago. And we've been talking to customers under NDA, we've been talking to software partners, but we're now at a point where we want to broaden the message. Um, you might have seen the announcement from Dell last week, HP announced uh, a platform last year. We have something running over here. So all very exciting times. Um, and when we talk about servers, we are really looking at cloud and our investigation has been how does ARM add value and how does the ecosystem around ARM add value in changing and putting really a positive spin on how we build out um, the cloud infrastructure. If I could ask you to remember one thing today, it would be that we really think Taiwan is at the center and has the massive opportunity to really leverage and drive um, profitable innovation around the cloud, and we're going to talk about that um, in the next few minutes. Three things, why ARM in servers, where ARM in servers, when ARM in servers. Okay, so I think about three things. I think about cloud as where information technology is the business. What do I mean by that? The server asset is the profit generating thing inside the business. It's not like a bank where it's supporting the business. It generates the, the profit. Why is that important? Well, these people will look to move to new technology if it offers a benefit, whether it's a performance per watt or whether it's a performance per cubic foot um, benefit. And so they've written and they've got their software and their hardware strategies such that they will be willing to migrate if they see something that benefits them. Secondly, workloads in the cloud are not all the same. I think of it as a mix of compute, networking, and storage. And if you look at something like a web server, it's very, very different from how you might see a Hadoop type of workload. And we actually believe that what you're going to see over the coming years is a range of very highly optimized system on chip devices coming out that will be specifically optimized for a particular class of server applications. Ian, I hear you say, you're completely crazy. Why would you do that? I didn't quite hear that. Okay. Um, we've been in energy constrained systems for 21 years. Okay. Now, granted, in a data center, it's a slightly different energy constrained system. 10 megawatts to a battery in a phone. Okay, very different. But what we've seen with that evolution in phones is that the way people think about how to do things, given increasing performance requirements and things like that in an energy constrained environment, forces people to think differently. Okay? And what you've seen in the latest phones, you start to see things that started in software like video playback moving to hardware. You will see the same thing over time in servers where you get a mix of heterogeneous environments, CPUs, sometimes GPGPUs, highly integrated peripherals, hardware accelerators for specific things. In this space, the end user owns a lot of their software. Remember I said, these people want to be more nimble at how they move. They're not going to wait for SAP to be ported native to run onto ARM. These people are looking at different ways of running their business. I want to draw your attention to Frank Frankowski's note on the right hand side. Uh, this is a gentleman in uh, Facebook, and he was uh, asked to comment after Dell's uh, announcement last week about their ARM-based server. How does he make his decision on CPU selection? Useful work per watt per dollar. Okay? He'll take it from anyone. One of the opportunities for Taiwan in here is to look at that, not just at a chip level, but at a platform level. If you have the power to go drive thought leadership and pioneer into this space. It's not easy. We're a different architecture, 86. It's different. But there is profit down that path. Okay? If you're willing to do that, these companies will go and buy from you. Okay? The value chain is changing. So, if I stood up here a year ago, I would have had absolutely nothing to say whatsoever. A year on, quite a bit has changed. Three things, I would say. Firstly, we talked last October about a roadmap to 64-bit. Um, we haven't exactly said when it's going to come. Um, we've said that we will announce more details about two processors later this year called Atlas and Apollo. Um, 
But I think that gives people confidence that we're moving in a path, because clearly in some server applications, you need 64-bit. The second thing is you're starting to see server announcements. HP announced on November 1st a platform called Redstone. Dell announced a platform called Copper last week. There's something over in the corner. Um, and the third thing is software building blocks. Clearly, this is going to take some time for ARM to come in. But I believe, and the ecosystem believes, that we have some core building blocks in place now. Canonical have shipped two commercial-grade Linux distributions since last year on ARM. We've been able to performance-optimize Java for ARM. Okay? Important for things like Hadoop. Um, so things are coming. And last month at uh, the Ubuntu Developers Summit uh, in Oakland, uh, near San Francisco, um, we showed, or actually one of our other silicon partners, Calzada, showed on one of their hardware boxes running a number of applications. Uh, they were running, they've been running their website, they've been running OpenStack apps, um, Ruby on Rails, um, Node.js, WordPress for blogging. I would submit to you that the actual things that they ran is somewhat irrelevant at this point. Okay? What they did was they took code, recompiled it, and it just ran. Now, we're going to have to go through cycles of optimization. We're going to have to look at how we manage things that are a big rack and all these sorts of things. But fundamentally, some of those building blocks are there now. Okay? And I think with that pioneering thing, you're willing to go and go down some of those channels. There is profitable innovation for the people in this room. And this is just showing a, a, a little bit of the, uh, the system at uh, Ubuntu. And as I said, um, this is the second distribution of a commercial grade Linux on ARM from our, our partners Ubuntu. Um, or I should say Canonical, the, the, the brand of the product is Ubuntu. So they've again been pioneering and really were, you know, four years ago, it was between us and Canonical who was the craziest that was going to go down this path. Okay? Um, and we'll argue uh, in a minute between myself and Mark who was craziest. But really, we were pioneering this space. And I think you're starting to see a point where other people can come in come in, the water's lovely. So again, it really doesn't matter quite now what they're running, but there are some software building blocks. OpenStack, for example, for those of you who don't know, is, is the software stack that the Open Compute Project from Facebook is using. Um, Rackspace has been looking at it. Citrix has gone in another, another direction, fine. So there's a number of things out there, but this software and the way these data centers write their code in high-level language gives ARM and gives people in this room an opportunity. Anybody heard of the US show Mythbusters? I was told that it comes over here on Discovery Channel or TLC. These are two rather strange American people that go and try to prove things, um, whether they're fact or whether they're false. And some people were concerned when I said I was going to go down this path because they thought we were going to blow something up on stage. So everybody's safe. Okay? Um, but I thought what we would do is talk a little bit about uh, some, some fact and fiction around servers. And with that, Chief Mythbuster, uh, Mr. Shuttleworth, my able assistant here, the CEO of uh, Canonical, I call you to the stage. Okay. Welcome. Hi, Welcome. So, first question. 64-bit technology, mandatory for cloud? Absolutely. What do you think? No, I'd say absolutely not. I knew you were going to say that. If, uh, well... It, it, it's more than just an answer of convenience. If, uh, if we look at the cloud workloads which are running today on, on the, the exciting public clouds, uh, so public clouds where there's you know, a very deep pool of innovation, Amazon Web Services, for example, now, a very large percentage of the workloads there are running on, on much smaller instances which have um, a relatively uh, little memory. Um, so those are virtualized um, small computers um, doing enormously useful work, um, but work that is easily addressable with a 32-bit processor. So no, I don't think 64-bit is a necessary requirement for cloud-oriented workloads in a, in a futuristic data center at all. Okay. Second one, Windows Server. What are you seeing in the cloud there from an OS perspective? So I think Windows, Windows is important, and we've seen some significant announcements from Windows on ARM in the last, in the last year. Not necessarily on the server space, but there's clearly an indication of a shift. Nevertheless, if you look at the if you look at the large public clouds again, um, Windows is a small, albeit growing, portion of the workload. There's a tremendous amount of legacy software that's focused on Windows, but the growth 
um, workloads, the scale-out type workloads, have all been pioneered on open source, pioneered on Linux. And Linux on ARM is now a very well-established platform for, for innovation and for um, uh, workhorse computing. So my next one, virtualization, what are you seeing there? Um, so again, most of, the, most of the public clouds, of course, do depend very heavily on virtualization. Um, what's interesting is we look at hyperscale type deployments where you're using, where you're looking at microservices, whether those are x86, whether they are ARM, um, people are starting to look at the entire compute substrate as, as almost a virtualized infrastructure. They can turn on and turn off the cores, the nodes, the systems that they need with the same ease that they could previously turn on or turn off a virtualized server. So while virtualization is important and, and is certainly in the roadmap uh, for all of the major architectures, it's not a, a, a blocker, I would say, to a, adoption and experimentation and uh, workload optimization um, for cloud-oriented workloads because you can essentially uh, uh, create very high-density racks of computing with microservers and then treat those as virtual servers in their own right, even though they're physical. Okay. Well, uh, and the last one I had was uh, the need for big single-thread machines in the cloud. Um, of course, the, the cloud today is built on, 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 on heavily virtualized infrastructure. Um, but again, the workloads that people are pioneering, the workloads that are, that are really aggressively changing the way people think about big data analysis um, uh, and, 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 and storage and so on, um, are optimized by parallelization, by, by breaking down the workload into a, into a, into, into, into a series of small and manageable um, efforts. And so, again, at this stage, um, it's, it's, it's interesting to start working with small units of computing um, and, uh, and pioneering and, 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 and optimizing for a different way of thinking about compute. So I think where, where we see things going, um, in terms of where on, in the cloud, to my earlier point. Certainly web serving, um, what I would call middle tier application like Memcache, good fit. Um, offline analytics, the word Hadoop, um, keeps coming up around in my discussions with various people. Um, and sort of storage systems, as you said, um, the sort of uh, uh, requirements on the CPU there we think is a good fit. And um, with that, maybe you can talk a little bit more about your workflows. I think you had the, the next bit. I'll let you go, or do you want me to flip? Sure, do you want to flip on it? You look lovely in that. Flower, by the way. Thank you. I feel like I'm going to get attacked by a swarm of bees at any minute here. <laughs> right. So the, the key question for, for folks looking at futuristic data centers is whether the data center of the future looks more like um, Amazon Web Services and a large cloud, or whether it looks more like the sort of traditional data, data center workloads. Um, from our perspective, the, the driving force of innovation at the moment is scale out. Um, and so horizontal scale is what people are really interested in. They're interested in the sorts of approaches that Google pioneered, that Facebook, Yahoo, um, eBay, and other companies use very heavily. But you take a big problem and divide that problem down into lots of small problems, which can be solved by smaller computers on a much more efficient basis than having big problems solved by very, very big computers. Um, so Hadoop is a brand that comes up again and again, both in cloud computing, but also in in, 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 in enterprise computing where scale out is very, very important. Um, open source is a very big driver <coughs> of, uh, of, of that work. And, and Ubuntu and the other Linux distributions essentially are highly portable across any sort of architecture. Um, uh, front of house, content management, intranet web services, collaboration and ser services and so on, are also a big driver of workloads. If you look at what um, a, a, a company like 3M does. They have thousands of products. Each of those products has product teams. Each of those teams needs uh, blogs, collaboration, um, content management, and so on. Um, those are small, lightweight workloads that can be run by small servers. Um, AWS is a big driver of innovation. OpenStack, um, a, a, a very open industry effort to create a private cloud infrastructure as a service. Is, uh, is a highly relevant brand as well, also open source. And then this, this hyperscale, hyperscale need of very, very dense computing, very small servers, very tightly packed, um, looking for efficiencies in space and in, in, in energy. Well, we only have about um, five minutes to actually our real time because we start a little late. So um, you, 
just go on to here and you maybe talk a little bit more on scale up. Sure. So, so right now on, on Amazon Web Services, for example, for enterprise workloads, about 60% of those workloads are running on Ubuntu. Um, and all of those workloads are therefore open source workloads that are very portable to any other architecture. So I think that's a very relevant statistic in terms of looking at what people are, are, are actually running in scale out scenarios. Um, we've been working uh, uh, with ARM for some time to bring those workloads to a broader audience. Um, and we're delighted to support both HP and Dell. But I think the piece that's been missing from all of that has been, has been some local innovation and local leadership. Um, and so I'm really delighted to, to, to join in today in unveiling some work that has been pioneered and led here in Taipei. Should we step forward? Absolutely. Right. So ladies and gentlemen, this is something of a milestone um, for you, but also in the world. This is only the third global OEM ARM-based high-density server solution to, to be revealed. Um, this was designed and built here in Taipei. Um, it is, what you see is a very dense, um, hyperscale-oriented ARM server solution from MyTAC. Um, and and it, has been, uh, it has been the work of, uh, of, of, of several teams over several months to bring up the operating system and to be able to demonstrate for you today um, a running server. So this, this, this server is not running, but over here we have the same server with uh, multiple nodes powered up. And you can see a visualization in a second. So we'll put up shortly for you a visualization of the, of the network traffic and the activity across all of those nodes. Um, so, so we have here in Taipei today um, working silicon, working boards, working rack mountable solutions with working operating systems and workloads ready to go. So these are cloud oriented workloads um, for highly parallelized jobs. Um, and uh, and, and the, the start of the, of the process to optimize those workloads um, has begun already. They always say working with children, working with animals on stage in live demos. Live demos. Um, so, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the features at, at, at the back end. Again, I'm sensitive, don't want to take um, time from the other speakers. So if we leave that running and then we'll carry on. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about? Your piece, or should I just? Well, if we just roll on to the differentiation yeah. story, I think that's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, Ian, you talked a little bit about optimized silicon for optimized workload. It's, it's a story that the ARM ecosystem is very strong at. Um, what we see today is, is deep activity by many different independent teams looking to differentiate their silicon, differentiate their offering. Um, the commoditization of compute. Um, has been extremely challenging for, for industry. Um, but we think we're entering an era now across the board where because of the diversity in the workloads that people are running in the cloud um, and because of the constraints of energy, um, it will be attractive for folk to run um, diverse, uh, diverse boards that are optimized for specific workloads. So whether the diversity comes from storage, from management, from, uh, from the number and nature of the cores that are on the board, um, from the fabric, the communications fabric that glues it all together, I.O. There's an opportunity here in an industry that is as, as in a place where you have as, as deep a pool of competence as you do here in Taipei, to create those, that, that diversity and to pull all of the pieces together um, to, give you, to give yourself a competitive edge in this rapidly change, changing environment. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, we talk a little bit, just to wrap up, and again, I'm sensitive to keeping us on the track. So, if somebody had said this morning, I'm going to come and see a box that has capability of 18, nearly 19 terabytes of memory that's ARM based, uh, I think it's pretty amazing. Um, this is Marvell based, um, 64 um, uh, SOCs, four, um, four cores per SOC. You see how that scales up. Um, space for uh, top of rigs, switches. You can, you can read the stuff there. Again, sensitive to time. 
um, and more detail. We'll actually be showing this in the arm suite and actually in the canonical suite, and I'll, I'll show that at the back. In terms of what's happening next, you'll see 32-bit servers ship this year from several people. Um, what that does is it starts the conversation about running real end customer workloads on ARM and comparing it to other things. So no spec in 2K or whatever stuff. It's down to how does your workload run and how do we compare really at a box level performance, power, space, etc., etc. Okay. You will see a broadening of devices and platforms. Cortex A15 is silicon that's made it into the mobile area right now. You'll see it coming into the server area. That's about 50% faster than the A9 on per thread. Hardware virtualization, support for more memory. And you will see, in the, and also I should say, the, the back end of next year, the second half of next year, you will see the first 64-bit processors from a company called Applied Micro. They announced uh, a very early partnership with us around 64-bit. And uh, you'll, you'll see systems uh, towards the second half of next year. And in 2014, that's when you're going to start to see a, a broader set of 64-bit platforms come into this space. Again, I mentioned the words Atlas and Apollo. We haven't said what they are other than the fact that they are 64-bit. And actually, specifically, ARM V8 is capable of 32 and 64. So you can assume that they'll be capable of being a fast 32-bit processor core as well as 64-bit. So in summary. Really, what we see is in the web infrastructure space, people are moving towards a different dynamic. You remember that quote I put up from Frank Frankowski on Facebook about how he judges which process are they going to go. 32-bit systems are going to shift. Um, we think, like Mark said, there's a great opportunity here inside the room to step up, pioneer, and drive some real value and interesting things into the marketplace. We'll all learn from there. And I think, you know, this is the first system, as Mark said, that was designed in Asia, has been demoed in Asia. We did it because we think this is the audience that's got the most to win out of this uh, transition to cloud. Get involved. Think about how you can come into this space. Like I said, come in the wallet. Oh, isn't that great? Yeah, 30 seconds from the end, or 30 seconds over and up goes. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll be showing stuff in a couple of other places. Great work on getting it up. We never, don't worry, don't worry. These things always happen. Um, Come to the canonical booth in Nangang, come to the ARM booth, you don't need, that's just a demo area, you can come up and see systems. We well, thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Thank you once again for your